before we do that, would you pray with me? Father, we give you thanks that we can gather around your word, and we pray that you would speak to us powerfully through your word this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand for the reading of God's word as Diane comes and reads our lesson? Our reading today comes from the third chapter of Ephesians, beginning with the 14th verse. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. All righty. Kids, hi, my name is Kelsey, and I'm here to talk to you today, and we're going to talk about God's love and how big God's love is. So to do that, I brought up a couple of measuring tools to help us kind of maybe see if we could measure how big God is. We're talking about how big God is, how big his love is, see if we could measure it. So first, I have this measuring cup. Kids, you might have seen this around your kitchen. Maybe you've helped your mom or dad do some cooking. Maybe you've used one of these before. So kids, I want you to answer me. Do you think you can measure God with this measuring cup? Do you think God fits in here? Anyone? No? No, I don't think so. God doesn't fit in here. Okay, well, I've got another one. I'm going to ask Brody to come up here and help me. I've got this measuring tape here. So this one, I think, I think we might be able to do it. Let's see how far out we can, we can take this. And we're still going, we're still going. Okay, this is pretty big. Kids, do you think God is bigger than this? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay, so it seems like we can't measure God with the measuring tape. I wonder what else we could do. All right, everyone, I want you to close your eyes. Adults, you too. We're going to have a little experiment here. I want you to ignore the rain that you hear on the ceiling and think about a sunny day. Think about you're standing in a grassy field. Kids, imagine you're standing in a big open field that's full of grass, nothing else, and you look up at the sky. It's blue. There's not a cloud in it. Now look up at the sky around you in your mind and see how huge the sky is all around you. Okay, now open your eyes. Do you think God is bigger than the sky? Yeah, God is bigger even than the sky. So that's kind of what we want to try and wrap our minds around today, is that God is so big that we can't even imagine it. God is bigger than what we can even think of in our minds, because the sky is probably the biggest thing that we see every day, right? And God's even bigger than the sky. So today we're talking about the Lord's Prayer. And the first line of the Lord's Prayer says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kids, you've probably heard the Lord's Prayer in church before. Maybe you even have some of it memorized. In that first line, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, that line tells us that God is really, really big, that God is holy, and that God's love for us is really, really big. It tells us that God is so big and his love for us is bigger than we could ever imagine. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is such a joy for me to be here in Columbus with you today. This is my first time ever to Columbus, so I'm checking it off my bucket list. <laughs> so, 
there you, there you have it. Um, grace to you and peace from God our Father and His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It really is such a joy for me to be here with you at Upper Arlington uh, today, and I'm here this week for some meetings we're having for LCMC, and, and, uh, and it's a privilege to be invited to share a message with you this morning. I want you to know, first of all, though, how much I love and how much I respect and how thankful I am for your pastors. Uh, I love Pastor Steve Turnbull. Uh, he's one of my, my great friends. I am learning to tolerate Pastor Brody Taphorn. <laughs> no, I, I love teasing is my love language. So if I don't tease you, you, you then, then you want to worry. So Brody's feeling the love right now. No, I love Brody so much. And, and Aaron, and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to know some of the rest of the team, like Pastor David and Katie and Kelsey and others this week while I'm around. I, I do want to point out, by the way, it always interests me that the coolest member of any band is the drummer. <laughs> Alex, yeah, yeah. And I don't say that because I'm an old rock and roll drummer from the 60s and 70s, by the way, Alex, but you're a cool man. I want to ask you a question as I begin this morning. We're going to come back to the question at the end of our time together in this message. And here's the question. How would you pray if you completed the following sentence honestly? I would love my Father in heaven to... Fill in the blank. I would love my Father in heaven to... Today we are, as Katie mentioned and Kelsey mentioned, we're beginning a sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. And the purpose of this message is to encourage and to equip us all for a practice, a life of prayer that is bold, confident, and persistent. A life of prayer that's based on the reality that we have a good, good Father in heaven who's determined to be good to us. A good, good Father in heaven who can make a way where there seems to be no way. Our scripture texts are going to be taken from Matthew chapter 6 where we have one uh, listing of the Lord's Prayer. And today from Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 through 21 as that passage was read. Now, of first importance to note is that in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, when Jesus begins this teaching on prayer with his disciples, he starts out by saying, when you pray. For instance, I'm praying right now, rain, get out of here. I have a golf game later today. In the name of Jesus, be gone. No, when you pray. So Jesus seems to expect that his disciples, that his followers, are going to pray and that they're going to follow his example in prayer and um, I need to make sure I'm, I'm clicking ahead I'm not used to using a clicker so here we go we have Jesus's first uh, a recording of Jesus's first time praying in Scripture in uh, Mark chapter 1 verse 35 which says and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Jesus begins his teaching on prayer, instructing the disciples uh, not only to pray, but to pray to our Father who art in heaven. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, 15, that we can not only pray to our Father in heaven, but that we can cry out, Abba, Father. In this verse, Paul precedes the Greek word for father with the word Abba, an Aramaic word that in our language might uh, communicate Papa or Daddy. Jesus himself calls God Abba Father in passages such as Mark chapter 14, verse 36. So we have Jesus and Paul who seem to be telling us that not only is God our Father who is in heaven, but there's a... a a tone to this relationship with him that can have a warmth and that can have an intimacy attached to it. As I say that, though, I realize not everybody 
immediately feels a sense of warmth or intimacy when they hear the word Father. Not everybody has had a loving, warm, intimate relationship with their dad. Some people have only known a stern, demanding, authoritarian, and unfortunately, sometimes even an abusive father. So when I think of that kind of father, one who's stern, demanding, and authoritarian, I think of the Von Trapp family in The Sound of Music. My wife, Debbie, and I, who sends her greetings today, by the way, she's at our home in Phoenix. In 43 years of marriage, I have been forced, uh, asked, <laughs> invited to watch The Sound of Music by my wife 1,327 times. <laughs> so I know this, this movie. And when we first meet the Von Trapp children, as, as you can see on the screen there, they're, they're standing at attention. And when they say the word father at the beginning of the movie, it's not like, oh, papa, daddy. It's, it's, it's like a, a military person saying, sir, yes, sir. And, and in fact, their father is a naval officer in the movie. But along the way, there's a transformation that takes place. And there's a, a restoration of this sense of warmth and love and intimacy between the children and Captain Von Trapp. And by the end of the movie, when they say father, it's father. Perhaps some of you, like me, are in need of a transformation of your understanding, your picture, your experience of the word father. Maybe yours hasn't been the greatest for whatever reason. And this is one of the things God can do in our lives. He can bring a healing to that place where there may be a wound when we think of father. Martin Luther speaks to this uh, whole idea of God as father as we pray with these words. Our Father who art in heaven, God wants to attract us so that we come to believe he is truly our Father and we are truly his children. He does this in order that we may ask him boldly and with complete confidence, just as loving children ask their loving Father. And author, pastor, theologian Graham Sellers says this, our Father in heaven is a good, good Father who's determined to be good to us. And there may be times when you and I know why he should not be good to us. There, there are times we can still be kind of naughty. We, we can be stinkers. Um, and, and we think we know that, well, I don't deserve God to be good to me. But in those moments, maybe most especially, God's determined to be good to you and determined to be good to me. And as that kind of ra reality breaks in on our lives, it can transform our relationship with God, and it can transform our practice of prayer. This relationship with God as Father can become the context within which we pray. Prayers that are bold, confident, and persistent. Boldness. Followers of Jesus can pray boldly. And the key to praying boldly is not in knowing the right words to pray. It's not in having the right formula. It's not in, in praying exactly the right way. Boldness in prayer is not found in how well or how right we're praying, but rather in our conviction of God's goodness and kindness to his kids. This is Anna Grace Sellers. Anna Grace was two and a half years old in this picture. And it was taken the week after she slapped her hand on my chest and prayed, Mr. Mike, in Jesus' name be healed, and I was healed of an incurable disease called alpha antitrypsin. My sister has it. She has a double lung transplant. My brother is getting a double lung transplant. I should be getting a double lung transplant. But a two-and-a-half-year-old girl who didn't worry about praying the right way, she didn't worry about using big theological terms, she didn't worry about using the right formula, all she knew was, my parents say God answers prayer, and she slapped her hand on my chest and said, Mr. Mike, in Jesus' name, be healed. You see, we as adults sometimes can hesitate to pray 
because we, we want to know the right way to do it. Sometimes we can struggle to pray as we, we search for the right words or the right formula. But that's what we do as adults, unfortunately, right? Sometimes we wait until we think we've got it right before we step out and act. Kids just step out and act. And they just step out and pray. In other words, kids simply pray and they pray simply. Have you, have you ever asked a child what they want for their birthday or what they want Santa to bring them for Christmas? Do, do they stand there and go, well, let me see, let me get this right. What's the right word? What's the, the right formula? No, they just blurt it out. In fact, they give you a pretty long list usually of what they might like. Kids don't worry about getting it right. They simply trust in the nature and in the heart of the one to whom they're speaking. And in the same way, you and I can pray boldly to our Father in heaven, knowing that he wants us to have our confidence in prayer, not in our abilities, not in our performance, but in the one to whom we pray and his commitment to being good to his kids. Followers of Jesus can pray boldly, and we can pray confidently. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, we read this. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. And in our text, in Ephesians chapter 3 today, it was, as it was read, we're reminded that we can pray confidently because we're praying to the one who can do far more abundantly than all than we ask or imagine. We're praying to one who can make a way where there seems to be no way. As I read these verses getting ready for our time together today, for the first time ever in my walk with Jesus, I found myself thinking about the Apostle Paul and these early followers of Jesus. When we first meet Paul, he's known as Saul in Acts chapter 7, and then in Acts chapter 3, we're, we're told Saul, who is going to become Paul, when we first meet him, he's dragging Christians off to prison. And so while I'm praying and getting ready for our time together here this morning, I'm, I'm thinking about him. And, and I'm thinking, did some of these early followers of Jesus think, we need to pray for this guy? Uh, was there somebody back there thinking, you know, if we could pray for Saul, and, and if he would become a follower of Jesus, wouldn't that save a lot of lives? And wouldn't that be a great testimony to God's love and to God's power? And, and thinking that, did some of them begin to pray, trusting in the goodness of God, trusting that Jesus came into the world to save the world, including Saul? trusting in God's power and his ability to make a way where there seems to be no way. Because there must have been somebody, right, who said, oh, no way. No way. Saul? I mean, other people could become followers. There's no way that, that he's going to become a follower of Jesus. But did some of them maybe trust that, you know, we worship a God who can make a way where there seems to be no way. Well, the more I've thought about it, the more I've become convinced that some of those earlier followers probably did pray. And in the end, God answers their prayer, and he answers it far more abundantly all that they could ask or imagine. Because Saul, who becomes Paul, not only becomes one of the leaders of the early church, he's written some of the books in Scripture and is being uh, 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 quoted over 2,000 years later. Wow, thank you for praying, somebody praying boldly and praying confidently. And we can also pray persistently because God invites us to. In Luke chapter 11, verse 5 through 10, we read this. Then he said, imagine what would happen if you went to a friend in the middle of the night and said, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. An old friend traveling uh, through just showed up. It's kind of like I showed up on Brody's doorstep the other day. Don't, and, and, and I don't have a thing on hand. 
The friend answers from his bed, don't bother me, the door's locked. My children are all down for the night. I can't get up to give you anything. But let me tell you, even if he won't get up because he's a friend, if you stand your ground knocking and, and, and waking all the neighbors, he'll finally get up and get you whatever you need. Here's what I'm saying. Ask and you'll get, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will open. Don't bargain with God, be direct, ask for what you need. When Jesus tells a scripture and story, there's usually one primary takeaway. And the takeaway from this story is don't quit asking. Be persistent. Keep on asking. Be persistent in prayer. And even as I say that, I have to ask myself, and I found myself thinking about that this week, who or what have I given up praying for? Who are the people in my life I've given up praying for? What are the situations I've given up praying for? So let's ask God today to renew in us a desire and to surround us with people who will join us in praying for those people whom we want to pray for and praying for those situations we feel called to pray for. Friends, the world needs followers of Jesus. The world needs you. The world needs me. Followers who believe that God is an active God in this world and who will answer the call to participate with him in his activity and in his mission in the world. And one of the ways that we can walk and participate with our good, good Father in heaven is by being a people who pray, <clears throat> who pray in a child, <coughs> excuse me, who pray in a childlike manner, who pray simply and simply pray, a people who pray boldly, confidently, and persistently. So I want to ask you that question again. If you were to pray, or to rather to complete this sentence honestly, how would you complete it? I would love my Father in heaven too. Well, right away, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm praying, restore my hair. But I, and wouldn't it be great if God would do far more abundantly, more than, than I, I could be a drummer again? How would you pray if you completed this sentence honestly? I would love my Father in heaven too. As we have the band come on back up, let's pray together this morning. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters and a chance to get together with them here this morning. And Lord, would you please be the one who will complete the sentence for us? Who is it and what is it you would have us pray for boldly, confidently, and persistently that others might be impacted by your love and your power. In Jesus' name, amen.